Over the years I've had my fair share of battles with algae, so in this video I want to talk about some things I've used to treat algae problems in the past, and some of the preventative measures I use. As they say, prevention is better than cure. G'day, my name is Kev. The aim of my channel is to help people build and maintain ponds without spending a fortune. If that sounds like something that interests you, you might like to subscribe and check out my website, ozponds.com. When I first started learning about ponds, the basic algae advice told me that algae need sunlight and nutrients, and if you take away one, algae can't grow. So the common advice is if you want to prevent algae, you should have lots of plants. Plants will shade the pond and they'll also take up nutrients. That sounds easy enough, and most guides will tell you to cover the pond with two thirds of plants, but that's a lot of plant coverage. I love plants. I mean, I own a wholesale plant nursery. Uh, plants literally put food on my table. But as for it being the answer to your pond algae woes, I don't think that they're the be all and end all. The first thing that I know is that plants trap sediments. Sediments carry nutrients and nutrients lead to more plant growth. More often than not, more plant growth leads to more sediments and more nutrients. Why? Because most of us are lazy, we won't trim off excessive growth. We'll let the majority of the decaying material fall into the water and re-release the nutrients back into the pond. And that has the potential to feed algae. Algae can grow faster than plants, and if there's a sudden influx of available nutrient, they'll be the first to capitalise. Now in saying that, it is possible to get the balance right. Snails and invertebrates like shrimp will break down the organic material into smaller manageable pieces for bacteria and other tiny organisms to break it down even further. Fish and other aquatic animals will feed on these smaller creatures and use that energy to grow. That's effectively pushing the nutrient up the food chain. These fish and animals need to be removed from the pond system though, otherwise they'll contribute more nutrients as they inevitably start to breed. We see this play out all the time in nature. Wetlands are full of sediments, plant life, even an abundance of different types of algae. And they're breeding grounds for aquatic life. Often then water birds come and feast on all this life and remove some of the nutrient and deposit some more. Over time, more and more sediment becomes trapped in the masses of plants. Eventually the wetland becomes a bog and eventually the bog becomes a meadow. In nature, this process plays out generally over thousands of years. In our closed loop pond system, this can happen much faster and every pond is different. Anyway, I've got a bit carried away with this explanation, but basically if we look at nature, we see that water bodies with low levels of nutrients have less plants, whereas water bodies with lots of nutrients have lots of plants. And again, even in my personal pond keeping experience, Ponds with lots of plants have more nutrients, they have more life, and that includes algae. So what is the alternative? The sun can stay, we're not going to try and stop that, but the nutrients have got to go. So our goal is to restrict and remove them. Water runoff. Don't let it in the pond. As water moves over land, it picks up all kinds of crap, and you don't want it in your pond. Don't overstock the pond. Again in nature, areas with lots of nutrients have lots of life. Areas with less nutrients have less life. And if you don't have too many fish, you don't need to feed them. They'll forage for themselves. If the pond can sustain more life, they'll breed. And if it can't, the young will get eaten. It's pretty brutal, but it's true. And if they do breed, consider rehoming or selling some. That will help maintain the balance that the pond systems become used to. Remove excess or dying plant material. This is easier when you don't have the entire pond full of plants. For the most part, I like to keep my plants on the margins so that they're easily accessible all year round. Buy or create filters that are suited for the type of pond you want to create. A properly sized filter system will eliminate single celled algae every time. It's the easiest algae to eradicate. So if you have pea green soup water, your filter is inadequate. In my opinion, you don't ever need a UV light. I've never used them. And if you're interested, I've got lots of videos that can help you build your own filter systems. 
that work just as good as expensive store-bought ones at a fraction of the price. You can find them by scrolling through the previous uploads and of course subscribe for future builds. String algae on the other hand is a harder beast to tame. This stuff grows on your rocks, walls, waterfalls and streams and can survive on pretty little amounts of nutrient. I've been experiencing an outbreak recently. It all started when I began topping up the ponds over summer. For years I've topped up my ponds with town water with no issue. This year though was different. As soon as I started topping up, the algae started growing. It turns out that a lot of water utilities will add phosphate to prevent lead poisoning. And phosphate in small quantities is an excellent food source for algae. Town water can also contain other dissolved nutrients and minerals. This past winter we had a lot of rain, so I would assume a lot of organic materials and sediments were washed into the local catchments. I'm also curious about the use of chloramines in town water supplies. Chloramine contains ammonia, which is a form of nitrogen, basically another food source for plants and algae. As soon as I got some rain again, the string algae started to dissipate, so I'm pretty confident that my issue was with the tap water. So at the moment I'm experimenting with water conditioners and phosphate binders, and I'm sure I'll do a video on that in the future. But longer term I think I'll be adding a water tank so that I can utilise rainwater year round. I should also mention that when water evaporates from the pond, the minerals and compounds like nitrate are left behind, so it is possible that going extended periods of time without fresh water entering the system, these minerals and compounds form a higher percentage of the water within the system. In an aquarium we often use water changes to dilute these buildups. In the ponds this happens during rain events when the pond overflows. I wouldn't imagine that this was causing my issue as the ponds hold quite a decent volume of water and they only really experience a few months of dry weather. But it might be something to consider in smaller ponds or in drier climates. Anyway, all of these things I've mentioned are preventative measures, but what can you do to treat string algae quickly? Well, the first thing is you want to adopt the preventative measures so you aren't reliant on the additives. I personally prefer to add as little to my ponds as possible. So the cheapest and best natural remedy is to just physically remove as much as you can. Just like trimming excess growth on plants, removing the algae effectively removes the nutrients that it took for the algae to grow in the first place. Products like Diatomics and New Algae are good at encouraging diatome algae, and that will compete with the string algae for available nutrients. Unlike proper plants that are slower to take up nutrient when a spike occurs, diatomes can react very quickly. Bacteria products can also help accelerate the growth of good bacteria, and they'll process nitrogen and phosphate. And these do occur naturally, but giving the pond an added boost during an algae outbreak can be beneficial. I do like Aquascape's Maintain product. It has beneficial bacteria, a phosphate binder, and a water conditioner. So it covers a lot of bases, and it's handy if you're regularly topping up with town water. Next up is barley straw, or barley straw extract. As this breaks down, it releases hydrogen peroxide, which will kill algae. Some people choose to add hydrogen peroxide directly in small doses. If you do, please put your dosage rates down in the comments to help other people looking to do the same. I haven't personally used it, so I'm not willing to advise on a dosage rate. And then we have the nuclear solution, which is copper. You can use copper ionizers or copper algicides. These are incredibly effective, but they're not good for invertebrates. I've used them in the past, but I won't in the future. I prefer to fully embrace the entire ecosystem. And having some algae is part of that ecosystem. So if the algae in my ponds is nice and short and doesn't appear to be actively growing, I leave it be. When it starts to get longer and I can clearly see it growing, I know something's amiss. I was explaining this video to my wife and she asked, so if I dose the pond with copper or hydrogen peroxide, would all the algae disappear? And I said, yep. But if I have no algae, I wouldn't know if there was an issue unless I was regularly testing the water and I'm too lazy for that. 
The way I look at it is a pond's a living thing and killing off one part of the ecosystem has never worked out well anywhere ever. We need the smallest of organisms and we need the apex predators. But at the end of the day, we're all individuals and have different views and expectations for our ponds. So you need to decide what works best for you. There's many different reasons why an algae outbreak occurs and there's lots of different solutions. So try different approaches and see what works for your pond and your situation. I'll leave a link to the products that I mentioned down in the description. Remember, these are just my opinions and experiences. I hope this wasn't too boring. If you thought it was helpful, feel free to tickle the thumbs up button. As always, thanks for watching. See ya.